Say it again. Check. Hello. Okay. Uh, look, it's me. I'm here. I'm here. I hope. I don't know. Okay. I, I guess yeah. I got to have faith in you. Yeah, that's probably fine. All right, let's probably. do it. You ready? I don't like that. We're f <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> All right, perfect. that was perfect harmony. All right, uh, let's go. <laughs> what's the deal? 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 Yo, what's the deal? What's the deal? What's the deal? What's the deal? Hey, what's the deal? What's good, everybody? I'm Steve Discourse. What up, y'all? It's your girl, Jay Cali. Back with another episode of What's the Deal? That's right. Today's, this week's episode, we've got a few stories related to climate change because, yes, we all should be concerned about this issue. Also, later on in the episode, we're going to talk about a D.C. lawmaker who's been getting a lot of pushback on whether or not we should be decriminalizing sex work. There's also um, a racial... There's also a racial discrimination case before the Supreme Court. It was argued last week, and it's been making a lot of rounds, but some of the details are a little bit unclear to a lot of people, so we're going to just clarify that a little bit. Also, I have a quick question. Why are millennials in terrible health? Is it the economy? Is it because we have terrible habits? I don't know, but keep listening and find out later on in the episode. We're going to consult with a boomer for the let's, answer. Let's get him in here right here, this empty chair next to me. Let's okay. go. Okay, boomer. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Apparently, so, I saw a meme this week that says, okay, boomer is an insult in the workplace. I was like, y'all are sensitive. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it, okay, they're boomer. the most sensitive. Exactly. Yeah. Shout out to the boomers that listen to this podcast because they want to know what us terrible millennials are up to. Also because they're our moms. So. Right. Hey, mom. <laughs> well, no, my, mine is. Your mom's a boomer. Mm. Really? Neither is mine. She's honestly. younger than that. That's what I meant to say. My mom is, uh, I don't know. My grandmother is a boomer. All right, let's, let's jump right in. Where do you want to start this week? Uh, let's keep it in D.C. with uh, this sex work debate. All right, so this is this story. I have some facts that I'm going to relay, and I have minimal amounts of opinion that I'm going to talk about because... I don't want to sound like an idiot, and I don't know enough about the nature of sex work, especially sex work in the city, to have an opinion about whether or not I think it should be decriminalized. But, okay, let's just jump straight into the facts. So uh, a lawmaker here in D.C., his name is um, Grosso. I mean, what's his first name again? David. Da thank you. Yeah, count council member David Grosso. Council member David Grosso has kind of presented this idea that sex work should be decriminalized. He's been doing a lot of work over the last few years, because I know back in 2017 this came up as well, to um, just try to rally a lot of support for people to, to say, yeah, let's decriminalize sex work. So what's happened with that in 2019 is they finally got a hearing. They were denied for a hearing back in 2017 because there wasn't enough information. People thought that they couldn't vote on it. There wasn't enough people who even knew about it. He didn't have enough supporters. There weren't a lot of people giving it pushback. It just didn't pick up any steam. All right, fast forward, 2019. So many people have had so many opinions about this case and if if uh, sex work should be decriminalized or if it should remain criminalized in the city. There's been a lot of uh, uh, transgender advocates for sex work, a lot of actual sex workers, uh, prostitutes, people, not people who are doing, well, yes, there are people who have done prostitution by force, of course, but a lot of the people who have come out in defense of decriminalizing sex work are in the field of prostitution by choice. They they make their money this way. There's no pimp forcing them. This is just what they choose to do. This is it's, 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 it's their choice. I just want to clarify that. Um, but, of course, where there's support, there are people giving a lot of pushback. Survivors of sex trafficking, survivors of child trafficking, uh, child sex trafficking, of course, um, and other lawmakers and council members in D.C., specifically Phil Mendelson, who... It kind of, I don't want to say is an opponent, but it kind of seems that way when I'm reading some of this information, especially in the Washington Post, where Grosso is saying, yo, it was voting time and you put all these conservatives on the board and you knew that they were going to give me all this pushback. And Mendelssohn is like, nah, actually, there was a 14 hour long hearing about this where so many people came and spoke out against decriminalizing sex work, basically saying you're going to turn D.C. into like a de facto red light district, like the people from the surrounding. Mm -hmm. States are going to come here 
to participate in sex work and then all this crime and, you know, unsafe sex and other risk factors will go up. And then the people who are in sex work are basically saying, all right, well, we have to have this, we have to live in fear of all these things. And then if we do get violated, if we do have someone being violent towards us, we can't report that crime because then we're at risk of being locked up for the fact that we're sex workers. So we we put ourselves at jeopardy of all the things that you're talking about, except we're not protected by the law at all. And the only thing people seem to think about is, oh, sex workers are being trafficked. Sex workers are being forced. You can't decriminalize it without thinking about the people that this is just how they make a living. People who can't find work other places, people are heavily discriminated against, like um, uh, transgender women in, who have been doing this type of work for a long time as like a fallback. And not to mention how risky it is to be out in the streets, period, especially when people are dying at alarming rates. And I'm not going to go off onto this tangent or this rant, but that's kind of the gist of it, these opposing forces. And what ended up happening was they said, hey, we just don't have the wherewithal to make a decision on this right now. We've been listening to people talk for 14 hours. Our brains are scrambled. We still don't know which way to go. And we don't want to, we don't have the voting power. It's impossible for us to make a sound decision. And they basically put it off again. That's what yeah, it's, uh, it's a really complicated debate for sure. Mm-hmm. With I, One important thing I think is to say that Sex trafficking is an issue, is mm-hmm. a real concern, but you know, laws like this typically aren't trying to legalize or decriminalize sex trafficking, human trafficking, right? And so so that's one thing. Right. Is it we don't want the victims of sex trafficking going to jail if a place gets raided, for instance. It's, you know what I mean? Yes. And it's a things like that because if people are being victimized in these industries, decriminalizing the actual work being done will help protect them. And and as you mentioned, you know, if they are assaulted or robbed or whatever it may be, this will give them protections that they don't have. And I mean, you know, there's there's a big case for health safety as well, yes. for a lot of proponents say. And I mean, you know, if, if you look at uh, the porn industry. That's sex if, work. If you, right. If you do that, like on the like the up and up sort mm-hmm. of like you have to get tested regularly. You know, if you, if you have contracts with some of these production mm-hmm, companies, mm-hmm. everything you're tested regularly. It's not like all these people working in this industry is, are just, you know, overrun with, uh, STDs and things like that. There's ways now, if it becomes closer to legal and not necessarily saying legal, but if it becomes closer to, um, if it comes out of the shadows, you right. know, then you're able to take protections and precautions for the people. But at the same time, yeah, there's a, a lot of um, emotional reactions and, and probably safety concerns that people have yeah. to, to, you know, that, that prevent them from wanting to support this. Well, I have a lot of thoughts about the things that you just said. I want to kind of backtrack all the way to what you said about victims. I think that there is, I don't want to generalize what people are thinking about the case because, of course, like you said, it's very, very complex. But something that we do see a lot of, which is why uh, there's so much support for decriminalizing sex work, is that victims do often get penalized for being victims. Victims do go to jail. Victims do fear reporting the crimes against them because they are the ones that end up in orange jumpsuits at the end of the day. And then the, you know, the perpetrators or the people who are very stealthy and who are really the muscle behind the the illegal uh, aspect of sex work, they kind of get away scot-free. And then you have also people who are in it by choice, who is just like, it's my body, my choice. If I want to make money by offering a service that's mine to sell, then I don't understand why I'm going to jail. It doesn't hurt anybody if I know that I'm taking the necessary and safe precautions. So there's that argument. But um, there's also, like you like you mentioned, there's personal stories that are attached. A lot of the people who spoke out, like I mentioned earlier, are survivors of um, sex trafficking, whether that be adult sex trafficking or child sex trafficking. Some of them um, worked in other aspects of sex work because sex work isn't First of all, trafficking is not sex work. It's trafficking, and it's two different things. And the decriminalization of sex work would not decriminalize sex trafficking. It would not make uh, it legal to be a pimp or anyone who was coercing somebody into um, selling their bodies or or selling sex in any form. That's never going to be decriminalized or legal because it's, it's heinous and it's not moral. But a person taking ownership over their own body is a different situation. So um, at the end of the day, I think that what's most important is that we are being careful. I'm not mad that they put it off again. I do want this to be a, a sound decision because D.C. could become a red light district. And 
I think there's ways to regulate what that looks like, just like they regulated the decriminalization of marijuana. You can't just buy it from anybody on the street, right? Mm -hmm. So um, sex work, you potentially could just buy it from anybody on the street. So there's there's a lot of factors into it, but... Let's just be careful. Let's be mindful. Keep your eyes open for, you know, more updates on the story. Get involved in the conversation. Talk to your local council members. Ask about it. Push about it, especially if you have strong opinions. And let's bring it back to the table. Keep the conversation going. It's clearly a, a big deal in the city right now, and I don't see the traction slowing down at all. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, let me jump into this Supreme Court case real quick. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's all that's all I was waiting for. Acknowledgement. I just want to be acknowledged. Um, okay. Byron Allen, mm-hmm. some of you may have heard of, some of you may not have, but he's um a TV producer. He owns uh entertainment entertainment television. Mm-hmm. It's a production company. And he sued Comcast and Charter Communications a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um for somewhere around 20 or 30 billion dollars billion yeah it was two two wow. suits and it was a ra- racial discrimination case yeah. right he was saying that he was not granted contracts for his tv channels due to race mm-hmm. uh, he's saying all things considered everything was generally equal and that's why he didn't get it so it was originally thrown out by one court he appealed It was brought back to life, and they say, well, no, there is grounds here, and it can continue. And now Comcast is appealing that to say, no, the grounds that he's suing are not valid. And so that's what's going on with the Supreme Court case, because it's been getting a lot of buzz around my social networks, and, and, you know, it's been getting a lot of press. They argued it last week, actually. So, A, it's already been argued, and we're, you know, now waiting for whenever the Supreme Court is actually going to rule on it. But I thought it was just important to say, if you've been reading about this, some people have a little bit of misunderstanding exactly what was being argued. And it's really mostly about the basis of the case. And the arguments came down to the Civil Rights Act of 1886, Mm -hmm. some language, right? And basically all persons shall have the same right to make and enforce contracts as is enjoyed by white citizens, right? The dispute is, does race have to be the only reason or... A different impactful reason factor. right one mm-hmm. of others mm-hmm. and a lot of the the a few of the justices seem to be receptive to the idea that well it doesn't have to be the only one like the reason it doesn't just have to be that but that's the only one listed in the language well but what is the language it's not clear so that's what okay. they're arguing right mm-hmm. so comcast is saying no the language says race has to be the only reason right. and you have to prove that that was the reason that we turned down your contract um lawyers for allen are saying well no it's got to be a factor a to, you know factor considered in and then ultimately why we didn't get these contracts that makes more sense so the supreme court you know according to a lot of reporting said uh justice kagan and who's the other guy um the beer guy Beer. Kavanaugh. Oh, I would. He likes know. to drink beer. Okay. Uh, Kavanaugh oh, and um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, just and and Stephen Breyer also kind of had sympathetic sounding questions. Mm-hmm. Comcast lawyers were also trying to argue where's the evidence, and mm-hmm. they they seem to be kind of saying, look, it's not necessarily about the evidence, but at the same time, you can never fully prove what was in somebody's mind anyway. So to say that it has to be only because of race is almost an impossible threshold to ever f- prove. So that's what we're waiting for. They're not going to decide. They're not going to decide the, the lawsuit that was filed in 2015. They're going to decide kind of the premise of the lawsuit and how it's going to go on. And that's going to affect everything else, though, right? Yeah. So presumably mm-hmm. they're going to come out and they're going to say, look, we think A, B and C. And then the, the lawsuit can either proceed in a normal in a lower court or if they you know rule something else, it won't be able to go forward. I kind of don't understand why they're so hung up on uh, race being the only factor or why they're not just guaranteeing that they won't practice any forms of discrimination, especially because all forms of discrimination are illegal. So it just seems like what is all the run around the mill about? Like, just yeah, change well, the language because you're tripping. Well, I, I mean, Comcast, well, you can't change the language of, of the, the, you know, the piece of the Civil Rights Act. But Comcast is saying, of course, they didn't <laughs> discriminate that. on race. But that's what 
the specific argument in the Supreme Court has come down to is the interpretation of this language that was the basis of the lawsuit. I'm curious to see how this uh, pans out, because that seems like something that will be extremely hard to prove. Also, Comcast is such like a major company. Are they national or international? Comcast, just just national. Oh, well, it's still pretty major. Yeah, they're big. And I'm no fan of Comcast. Um, I have Comcast. So do I. Oh, and I still don't like. No, it. I don't. I don't like them either. Full, full disclosure. I would rather have FiOS, but FiOS costs more, so I have Comcast. I'm actually probably going to switch to FiOS soon because my Comcast bill just went up. Anyway, you know what we uh, should switch to soon? Say something ridiculous. Another story. Oh, that was it. See how I did that? All right, okay. Because I think to? we've said enough, right? We don't need to. We had, we were clearly already going off on a yeah. ramble about our own personal cable life. Right. No one wants to hear about it. But yet, here we are. All right, so what you got coming up next? What are we talking about? We've got a suite, a package of climate change stories. And we've got a story about increasing chronic health conditions for millennials. I want to get into this that's, one. I wish we had a room full of millennials but, right now, but, but let's talk about the what? climate change Well, stuff. yeah, because I, th- I think we should save that. I think that'll be better. Yeah, I That'll agree. be better at the end. <laughs> okay. You should got so take... excited about it. Yeah, well, exactly. So and I realized, man, I'm so excited about it. This will make sense to hold off on. Let's go to a break first, though. Let's do it. So we're going to come back. We're going to talk about climate change and how it's ruining a lot of lives, but also how we can fight it. (laughs) Optimism. All right. What's the deal? We'll be right back. While we're on this break, we want to remind you, do not forget to share the podcast. Share it to all of your social media platforms, your Facebook, your Instagram, Twitter, don't forget to use the hashtag What's the Deal Pod whenever you share anything. And like and subscribe the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, wherever you listen. Thanks for spreading the love. You know we appreciate you. All right, y'all, we are back from the break. We want to jump right into those stories. We promised you. Let's talk about climate change. Climate change. All right. So um, do you guys remember a couple of years ago, massive protests over the Keystone XL oil pipeline? Uh, yeah. How could we forget? They did it for a long time and people were hurt severely and oil yeah. spilled immediately after. Basically. Yeah. So there was an oil spill. Uh, recently, there was an oil spill with the um, Keystone pipeline, mm-hmm. which is not the Keystone XL pipeline. It's the one that's already there. It's not the XL it's the just a regular XL keystone. Was the one that they were trying to put there. Yeah. Insane. It's just a regular keystone, uh-huh. right? So 210,000 gallons of leaked oil last week. And um, why are we talking about this? I'm not in North Dakota. Are you? I mean, South Dakota, excuse me. I'm not in any of the Dakotas, nor will right. I ever be. I'm, I'm not in any of the states that go from Alberta down to wherever the, the pipeline goes. But here's the thing, right? Mm-hmm. We're trying to talk about climate change around the world right now, right? Greta Thunberg and all that. Yeah, Tun- yeah, yeah Thunberg, Greta. right? The, you know what I mean? Greta. Greta. <laughs> um, and the the crazy thing about these pipelines and this oil is the leaks are are expected. Like when they say, when, when companies will talk about safety of any of these facilities, mm-hmm. you know, the joint that blew up, the BP oil, you know, thing in the Gulf. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? That was, yeah, several yeah. years ago, uh-huh. right? All these are kind of expected. It's and so when these, when companies say that a pipeline or another operation or whatever is safe, that's like relative. They that's, say, oh, it's yeah. going to be pretty safe. They don't mean nothing bad will come of this. They just mean you know all things considered, based on our understanding of this technology and everything, it's safe. They never say there won't be any oil spills. Yeah, like all the standard crap that we expect to happen is surely going to happen, but. Outside of that, this will be less not. oil spills than there could be. Right. That's that's kind of the yeah. implicit, right? And so, this is what we're dealing with right now: is a debate with can we get off of these kind of fossil fuels? Mm-hmm. That's what a lot of this stuff is about. We've talked about the Green New Deal on this show a couple times, yeah. and part of that is to say how can we move forward overall as a country while doing while eliminating stuff like these fossil fuels, and also benefiting all of us at the same time, right? And so one of those ways is some new technology. They just they just innovated here. You That's got a story right. About All that, right. Let's talk about it. So 
There is an ultimate power source that um, it wasn't recently discovered. We've known about it for quite some time, but they realized that if we start to use this power source more and more, that we could reduce our use of like fossil fuels and things that cause harm to the environment. And that ultimate power source is the sun, a star which has been in our galaxy since the beginning of time. So basically, uh, solar power is what we're turning to. Now, you might be asking, why are you talking about this as if it's like some breaking news? We've always known about solar power and we've continued to neglect to actually use it. Okay, well, we got some new, new technology, also something, uh, you know, a little bit archaic, mirrors, mirrors. What they discovered is the reason why we couldn't use solar power effectively in the past is because it has to be hot enough uh, to, to generate power, but it also has to be hot enough and consistent enough to where we know that um, it'll be substantial and that we could kind of elim- not eliminate, but se- severely reduce our use of things like oil and coal and blah, blah, blah. So what they discovered recently is if they use a a certain type of mirrors and turn them all to reflect the sun's rays onto a focal point, it can generate enough energy, enough power and enough heat to like to basically I don't I don't really understand the scientific because I'm looking at a number letter combination, but the right amount of power (laughs) that we could could severely like reduce our use of these types of um, fossil fuels and things like that. Right. And specifically. With this, um, what was it called? Heliogen? Yes, was the company. This Mm -hmm. is the company. And essentially what they did is they got a computer algorithm or or artificial intelligence Mm -hmm. that would know how to precisely alter all of these lenses. At once. Correctly and at once to this focal point to produce almost 2,000 degrees of heat. 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, here's why it's big, right? Because we have solar panels on our houses and Mm -hmm. everything, right? That's for your little microwave. But this stuff right here, we're talking about industrial level heat. Yeah. So the hope for this is that we can now use this heat instead of burning lots of fossil fuels to create concrete and other industrial types of building materials. And I think, did I, do I remember this right? Do you, do you have this in there? They cite, I think, concrete as creating concrete as like 7% of global carbon emissions or something like that, right? Um, they definitely said something about concrete, but I can't tell you exactly. I think it was seven percent. But so the idea is, we don't have to spend all this time and energy and resources, a shipping oil through these pipelines, mm-hmm. spilling it all over the Dakotas, <laughs> just to get it over here, right. just to create some concrete, just to ship the concrete over there, and then you know build whatever we got to build. This is big. And I think that the big deal is that this computer vision, what they're using to make sure that the computers accurately turn all the mirrors at, to the right exact angle, that's what like is this new breakthrough in technology that we never had before. Because um, I'm only saying that because I made jokes about how we've always had the sun and we've always had mirrors. But it's computer vision that's new, and that's what's making all of this possible. And what the huge, huge implications outside of not utilizing oil and having oil spills and shipping it across the world is we get to reduce our global carbon footprint and hopefully reduce the freaking greenhouse gases that we've been using with all the, you know, industrial blah, blah, blahs and climate change or whatever. Now, why do we need to do that? Because if you've been reading sensational weather news the last week, they haven't. You, you, somebody might have, because this <laughs> is, this is just like meme worthy, almost level stuff. If you know what happened in Venice the last week, Venice, the city in Italy, we know, we know, yes, flooded in major ways that has only happened twice, six times in the last hundred years, mm-hmm. but it's happened twice in the last, um, like, like 20 years. Mm-hmm. Oh, shoot. I lost the link. I had it up here, but anyway. So yeah, Venice, there's, there, there was viral videos of a guy swimming through a major plaza in Venice. I mean, there's people, elderly folks getting helped along. This was a lot of chaos. Right? Are you telling now, me that in the water that people are swimming through, the elderly are also simply walking through? Is that what you're telling me right well, now? Well, you know, millennials, we're sensitive. We got to swim. The, the older folks just, they walk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now Venice, of course, obviously, you know, is a city on water. Basically, it's built across a whole bunch of islands and they've got all these canals and waterways. So, okay, not as maybe not surprising you say, okay, well, that was a bad place to build a city anyway. But again, these conversations about climate change and carbon emissions, the carbon emissions get up into the ozone and in the atmosphere. What they end up doing is trapping heat 
on Earth instead of, you know, just yeah. water and woo, 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 mm-hmm. out into the you know solar system. And then what that does is, boom, it reflects back, melts the ice caps. The ice caps come down into the ocean. Ocean rises. Boom. Next thing you know, you're up to your knees in water in Miami next time you go for a vacation. Hard to get a lap dance at Miami strip clubs if there's water up to your knees. I just feel like they would turn all the strip clubs into swim-up bars and everything would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> That is not sensitive. That is so, so insensitive uh. to their plights. Um, but yeah, so seriously, most coastal cities all over the world are are seriously at risk at these rising sea levels. Yes, that's and true. And that's why this solar power technology that we're just talking about is important because in any way that we can, we got to stop burning these fuels. We got to stop lighting fires is really what it comes down to, right? And we light the most fires to create energy to do a whole bunch of stuff. So that's why this stuff is important. California has had wildfires like crazy. That's also a result of varying climate change. Um, And then they also had two or three months just recently with no rain. And now they're on flash flood warning because they're going to finally get rain now for the first time in, in a couple months. All this is adding up, man. It's getting crazy, right? Think about this. You ever spin like a top or a quarter? Yeah. And it's real tight and it turns really, really nice at the beginning when it's fast. But when it starts slowing down, it kind of wobbles, wobbles all over mm-hmm. the place and then falls down. That's what's happening We're now. In the wobble? Which is why oh, these no. people, yeah, and it's not like the song. It's not fun. I w- the song definitely started playing in my head immediately. Right, see? And I was like, this could be fun. So, but it's not. Because people will be like, well, it was pretty cold the other day. How's that for global warming? <laughs> Right. But that's the point. We're going to go up and we're going to go down and we're going to start just it's extremes. Right. And so enter the Green New Deal again. This is Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. It's it's not even my favorite thing, but I think it's more important than we all feel like it is. Mm -hmm. I don't even feel like it's important. I know it's important, but I don't normally have like that fervor. Go Steve. You know what I mean? There's other stories we get more worked up on, but I'm trying to figure out how I can talk about this on air in the same excitement and urgency that it really needs. We basically just have to get big green signs and run around the city and block all the intersections. I mean, I've got a shirt. Oh, that's not that good says enough. Green New Deal. It has to be a neon green poster board from see, Walmart. See it, it, see it in my latest post on Instagram at Steve. Discourse. I already saw it. Thank you for that. I don't know how many people saw it because Instagram recently changed their. You don't see that thing? anymore? No, do you? Yeah, it's just a trial run, and I haven't met anybody unfortunate enough to have gotten scooped up in oh, it. Oh, I don't care. I Tell me what life is like. Man, <laughs> that's a topic we should have talked about, but we don't have time for that right now. We'll talk about so, it another day. the Green day. New Deal, anyway, um, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, congresswoman mm-hmm. from New York, and Bernie Sanders, senator from Vermont, mm-hmm. recently proposed this uh, Green New Deal for public housing. And here's the idea. There's massive upgrades that need to be done to public housing all around the country. The work orders are way, way backlogged. We're not getting any of the work done that we really need to do. But what they said is, look, a lot of the upgrades that need to be done are serious, deep renovations and projects. It's not like come in, hang up new curtains. Yeah. Come in, pull the old fridge, put a new one in. Mm-hmm. There, There's stuff to do with lead paint and asbestos abatement and things like that. So they said, if all this work needs to get done, we can easily tag on extra work onto that that will upgrade all of these buildings for more renewable energy sources. Okay. So what they're going to do is they're going to improve public housing across the country. And the claim is that it's going to create 250,000 jobs. It's going to reduce individual people's electricity bills and their power bills, their utilities, Mm -hmm. because all the building facilities and then the appliances in the units are all going to be upgraded. And so we're going to reduce our footprint, which is good for, you know, the swim up strip clubs in Miami in the future. That I'm looking forward to, FYI. You are, okay. Um, But it's also going to be creating these jobs. Interestingly, right, so this green, the new, the Green New Deal overall and the Green New Deal for public housing Mm -hmm. have obvious left wing political connotations. Yeah. Because of the people presenting it and because of the ideas. But they also say most of the benefit, most of the building and the jobs related to the building will happen in conservative leaning states. So there's should theoretically be bipartisan appeal for that. Again, these are repairs that need to be done anyway. They're backlogged. So they're gonna say, hey, look, we're gonna find we're gonna get funding to do even more than just that. So but the other thing is a lot of people have a hard time saying, all right, well why why would I care? I hear you, but I got other things on my plate right now. Mm-hmm. But to me, a big part of 
why the climate crisis is a is an issue for everybody is because it affects how much uh, you're going to be affected by how much money you have. Can you move? Can you relocate? Can you survive any given emergency or catastrophe? Right. So we talk about gentrification on the show a lot and homelessness. We talk about people stressed in their budgets and their incomes. Right. Yeah. And so can get displaced just from economics, from people wanting to move in and prices rising and, and inflation and housing costs and everything. Climate change is going to be the same thing. The climate is going to change. Sea level might rise. Who can move? People who have the resources and the true, money to move. True, true, people true. have the time to think out ahead. Somebody who might have the investment money to go buy a house somewhere safer as you know, an investment property rented out. And then when time comes, pack up, get on out of there, right? It, it's same thing when a hurricane is coming. Who, you know, a lot of times the people who are stuck are the people who can't just take up off of work, who can't rent a, a vehicle to get out. Maybe they don't have a vehicle anyway, so you can't take public transportation out of a hurricane zone. Uh-huh. It's a lot of people like that that are caught up in these types of emergencies. And climate change is going to make that worse. You know, and it's far widely reported that that um, a lot of Southern Hemisphere countries and um, the less economically developed sort of nations are going to be the ones taking the brunt of this as well, right? So the more money you have, the more resources you have, you're going to be able to kind of protect yourself in, the, think, same, in the same way that gentrification works. So it's, it's really, you know, yeah. We that's all always the case. Like we, it, we are relating it now to climate change and natural disasters and things like that because it, it makes sense in context of this conversation. But you could literally unplug only those who have the financial resources to dot, 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 and replug it back literally every single conversation that we ever talk about. Because in America, 90% of things dwindle back down to do you have the financial resources mm. to dot, dot, dot. Like, it's always the case. So if you're poor, basically, you need to know more politics than everybody else. Yeah, and guess Damn. who doesn't know more politics than everybody else? Poor people who yeah, don't have freaking time to stop doing their jobs and taking care of their families to... Right. Okay. This could turn into a whole nother conversation. Speaking of, let's pivot right now, right while while I got this on my mind. Speaking of working all their jobs and not having time, you know who doesn't have a lot of time? I sure and works do. a lot of jobs? Yep. Who? Millennials. Damn. I knew it. Millennials yeah. right now are in a little bit of a health crisis. I'm going to call it what it is. It's a health crisis. I was trying to think of a better word. Um, so millennials have been suffering from hyperactivity. Millennials have been suffering from depression, along with some other um, mental ailments and physical ailments such as hypertension and diabetes. High cholesterol. High cholesterol, exactly. Um, really at a rate that I would consider at an alarming rate. According to some numbers from Blue Cross and Blue Shield associations, millennials are up by 31 percent between 2014 and 2017. For depression, they're up by 29% for hyperactivity, hyper, it's hyperactivity, right? Hyper, or hyper, yep. Yeah, like they're up by 29% in that area just because of our lifestyles. And when I say our lifestyles, I don't mean that we like to hang out on rooftops and drink margaritas. I'm talking about because the state of the economy that we were um, welcomed into. For example, many millennials started working at around the year 2008, sometime in between there. And American economy was at like an all-time low. We were literally in a recession, and it didn't get much, much better from there with student loan debt and uh, many millennials having to grapple first of all student loan debt period also getting where the one of the most educated generations of people so we have all this education but we don't have the jobs to back up what we know and what we do we're we're tech savvy we're a very tech savvy generation we're known for bringing a lot of diversity into communities and into the workplace we're known for being very um mentally astute However, no one wants to pay us for our services because boomers, first of all, sorry boomers, are still working in the work field and have all these top tier positions and it's just hard to break through. So what that leads to is a lot of health concerns, mental health concerns and physical health concerns that we can't afford to pay for. And now they're basically saying you're going to go broke paying money to your doctors because y'all are like struggling. We um, are at risk for having more like early deaths than the previous generation, according to the same study. So I think, just uh, a lot of strife. I think they also reported that, what was the number that have quit jobs due to uh, mental health reasons? Oh, it was something like 33% or I don't want to quote an exact number because it, it was something around that area. Yeah, it was, it was high. So yeah. 
Um, what's interesting, if you read, never read the internet comment section, but Always. if you do read the comment section, you know, it's, it's, it's funny to hear older folks who don't identify with that demographic. I don't know how old they are because they're on the internet, but the comments about being weak or whatever, oh, mental health reasons why you quit. You know, back in my day, yeah. we didn't quit. A, it overlooks the fact that, well, you probably raised the people that you're criticizing right now. So way to go. You right. fucked it up. But, um, the other thing is, as far as a lot, you know, if, if you ask me why I think these would be happening, all we do is work. It seems to me, right? Huh. Like, like if, if you, if you I follow relate. the rise of the gig economy mm-hmm. and the side hustle, side hustle is a word us. in the dictionary That's now. Us. So we're always working. We get off of work. We go do some other work yep. or we probably sit at home thinking, man, how can I get my money right? You just came from work. Oh my God, that's crazy. So I was, I, I don't know who I was talking to about that, but yes, millennials is definitely the generation of side hustles. Um, Uber popped up uh, for our generation and Lyft. Things like Postmates popped up for our generation. Things like, um, like what are those? Like bike shares and scooter shares and all the, well, those aren't technically side hustles. But um, what else is a different side hustle? Task rabbits and all sorts of online apps I'll, where I'll you I'll tell you a side hustle to to related to, to the scooters. You might be the person getting off of work, throwing a bunch of scooters in the back of your car and charging up the batteries and in the morning on your way to work, dropping the scooters exactly, back off on the street. Exactly. So we, we just have so many side hustles. I was actually just talking to one of my friends that I need to pick up a side hustle. Why do I need to pick up a side hustle? Ugh, because it's like... I don't I don't want to talk about me, but let's just say if y'all know a good side hustle that I can get into, please let me know. But something that's cool to do, I'm glad that you mentioned it, is to look and see what new words and phrases were added to the dictionary in a certain over the span of a few years. Because it really tells you a lot about where society is, like side hustle just being added to the dictionary. Another word that was recently added, heteronormative. Come on now. That just really talks about where we are as a society, a society right now. But um. Yeah, sorry, but millennials are out here struggling and overworking, i.e. me and Steve Discourse just mm, Yeah. A lot of us on. a lot of us have a lot going on. We're still chasing school. And honestly, we're yeah. more edu- we're more educated. Honestly, I know a lot of people in graduate school because they went to college and they're trying to figure out how they can make ends meet. Actually make ends meet. Yeah. So they're college like, well, how about graduate lucrative. school? Yeah. Right? So in a lot of ways, these chronic kind of health conditions mm-hmm. are 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 not coming out of a place of weakness but probably just really being overworked we work 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 like rihanna exactly and you know i I think this is really relevant to the presidential debate Mm -hmm. tell me more because one thing is health care how do we handle health care in this country you know and you can go bernie and just give one setup for everybody make sure they're all on it and let's get it done or you can do some compromises or, or whatever, like you know, Biden and Buttigieg and everybody else is offering. But the fact of the matter is, healthcare is becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger chunk of our budgets. That's a stressor right there. Yeah, so that's, not that's only exactly not only say, not only do we are we overworked and we have this hypertension from being concerned about our budget, being concerned about how to fit in all these jobs, right? But now we're like, well. We're concerned about affording some health care for the things that we know are happening to us because we're worried about everything else in our lives. And so this health care thing is is really because of this report. It actually takes on a new urgency, I think, for for somebody my age and my generation as a millennial. Right. Because we need to be able to now at least go and get care for these things. But that is a major stress on our budgets and on our minds. When do, we're working so much. When do you get time to go to the doctor? You don't. Nobody's going to pay you. You you lose out on that earning potential because you have to take an afternoon and go to the doctor. You know, you you miss out on the earning potential, and now you got to pay for that doctor's visit on top of that, right? So it's a double whammy because we don't, you know, we, if, people don't get a lot of paid time off. A lot of people do. I know several people in my life who have lots of time off, and I'm secretly jealous, and I hate them for it. But, <laughs> you know, but it, it's so we got to have a serious conversation about this as millennials and as anybody else, because Do this we? is going to be a it's going to be a big cost. It's going to get expensive for the country. Here's the thing. When you said, hey, let's talk about uh, health care and health risk and the financial stability or instability of millennials. And I was all down for it and I was ready to do this story. And now I'm triggered. 
When did that get added to the dictionary? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now I'm totally triggered. I'm like, dang, my life is, I love my life. I appreciate all the hard work that I do, but currently um, everything sucks. And uh, being a millennial is really, really hard. And I never want to talk about this ever again. So I will say this. This is what I'm about to do. When I leave the studio, number one, I'm going to go eat a very late dinner because uh sacrifice. Also, I'm going to do some self care whatever that looks like to me i don't know what it looks like yet i gotta go home and figure it out but if you are a millennial i just have to say it self-care is super duper important for you do not overwork yourself you are not a slave the money is always going to be there in fact i'm sure that you have enough money to make ends meet millennials also have a tendency to want more 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 um you you you're good where you are maybe all right you know Elevate your purpose, elevate your status, elevate your bank account, elevate your degree, elevate all of that. But if it comes at the expense of your happiness, your actual joy, your health, your security, your sense of self, self-worth, self take a break, take a pause, you know what I'm saying? Remove yourself from the distractors, whatever it, it means to you. Take care of yourself, find joy, find worthiness in all that you do, period. J. Callie out. I'm Steve Discourse. I'm Jay Callie. That's the deal. All right, people, thanks so much for tuning in another week to What's the Deal podcast. You can follow us on social media at Steve Discourse and at It's Jay Callie. We got to send a huge shout out to my man Clifford Cartel for composing our theme music. And wherever you listen to this, make sure you subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Leave us a review because those really help. Share it with your friends, share it with your family, your loved ones. Heck, share it with your enemies. We don't care. Just get the word out there. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> why are you writing what I'm gonna say <laughs> I'm not Where? gonna say hey Where? what's good everybody Angela hey I'm not gonna say that's that. not what it was you're, you're <laughs> reading notes out of context as you know we're back yay I'm not gonna say that <laughs> okay, this why is are you reading stuff. that stop it what am I supposed to be reading this, back from break use 20 20- yeah. It's 2019, everybody. The year is almost up, and we really, really, really need your help. You might wonder why. What could I do? I don't know how to record. I don't have access to the studio. You know what you do have access to? The green stuff. The Benjamins, baby. We need your cash. And it's not because we're broke. It's because we spend a lot of money keeping this show gorgeous and sexy. And we need you to put on something tight and help us keep it that way. <laughs> All right, okay. I don't know what I'm going to say. What's good, everybody? Steve Discourse here. And listen, you know, if you've liked anything that we've been doing and you appreciate it, we would love for you to just break us off a little bit, throw us some support, because we do need help with some money for, for online web hosting fees and for, you know, editing and recording and producing these episodes. However much you can, a dollar, five, ten, twenty dollars, anything you want, we really appreciate that. You can send us donations through our cash app at WTD Pod. You can also Venmo us at WTD Pod. If you would like to send us monthly payments, which we would be ever so grateful, hit us up on Patreon at Patreon dot com slash what's the deal thanks so much